In my mid to late 20s, I found myself working as a security guard at a Kmart supercenter in the quiet town of Iowa City, Iowa. For those unfamiliar, Kmart was essentially a budget-friendly hybrid of Walmart and Target, popular back in the early 2000s. Unfortunately, many Kmart stores eventually closed down, but I was stationed at one that was in the process of relocating. My job was relatively relaxed, if not a tad dull. I spent my shifts solo, with nothing to do but keep a watchful eye on the empty store. To pass the time, I often played games on my phone or exchanged text messages with friends. One fateful day, I was scheduled to work a double shift, covering both the day and night duties. The reason for this grueling schedule was that the other security guard, responsible for the night shifts, had abruptly quit in favor of a career in real estate. The concept of a two weeks notice apparently eluded him entirely. They extended my shifts until a replacement could be found, and this change irritated me to no end. Sitting alone in a dimly lit store at $14 an hour was hardly a dream job, but I felt I had no choice in the matter and reluctantly accepted the double shift. Throughout the day, I watched movers relocate shelves and equipment, making the hours pass relatively uneventfully. As the clock neared 7 p.m., I mentally prepared myself for a long, solitary night shift in an empty store, illuminated only by the faint light emanating from a small office in the back. Fast forward to around 1 a.m. I was seated in my chair near the front of the store when I suddenly heard one of the radios turn on in the back office. Radios occasionally picked up stray signals from other sources, so it wasn't an uncommon occurrence. Paying it no mind, I returned to browsing my phone. However, the radio sprang to life again, this time with a much stronger signal. This time, a low, grainy voice emitted from the radio and it sent a chill down my spine as it whispered, I can see you. My heart plummeted into my stomach and a sense of dread washed over me. I called out, asking who it was, but received no response. I turned to glance at the back exit of the store, the dime red glow of the exit sign revealing the silhouette of a person. They appeared not to notice me, and I chose to play dumb by looking away and discreetly shutting off all the radios. I couldn't simply return to my post with a potentially dangerous intruder in the building, so I did the only thing I could think of. I bolted toward the front entrance. I could hear footsteps behind me, someone trying to catch up. Thankfully, I reached the door and locked it securely behind me. Outside, I caught my breath and dialed the police. They arrived swiftly, but by the time they entered the building, the intruder had vanished, likely through the emergency exit. The officers concluded that the individual had fled the scene. Despite their presence, I couldn't shake the image of that menacing man from my mind. His wild eyes and menacing grin haunted my thoughts. I continued working at the job for another month before securing a higher paying position that didn't require night shifts. I never encountered that man again, and I fervently hoped I never would. Yet one nagging question lingered in my mind. Why hadn't any of the store's numerous night vision security cameras captured the intruder near the exit, even though they were pointed in that direction? When the police and I reviewed the footage, there was no sign of anyone else inside the store, just me. This unsettling mystery added another layer of unease to an already terrifying experience, reinforcing my decision never to work another night shift again. I often spent my spare nights working for DoorDash. It was a convenient way to make extra money without committing to a second job. On this particular night, I started my delivery shift around 9 p.m. The evening was progressing steadily with orders flowing in until around 11 p.m. when things began to slow down a bit. During this lull, I found myself circling a shopping center that housed most of the fast food restaurants people frequently ordered from. Just when I thought my night might be winding down, another order popped up on my screen. It seemed like a typical request, a delivery about four miles away. I picked up the food and punched in the delivery address. Almost immediately, I noticed something odd. The address seemed to point to an empty lot, but the DoorDash map wasn't always the most accurate. 
I decided to head in that direction, thinking I could check it out and possibly call the customer if there was an issue. I followed the directions for nearly 20 minutes and eventually I arrived at the designated street. The place seemed eerily desolate, with no houses or crossroads in sight and no other cars on the road. As I reached the end of the street, it transitioned into a gravel road and there, on the side, stood a weathered, small wooden sign that was barely legible. I drove onto the gravel road, turning on my bright headlights. In the distance, I could make out a faint shape. As I drew nearer, my phone chimed, signaling that I had reached my destination. In the glow of my headlights, I saw a dilapidated RV with crudely painted numbers on its door. I double-checked my phone. The address matched 2760. Feeling a shiver run down my spine, I got out of my car, clutching the bag of food. As I approached the RV, an unsettling feeling washed over me. The RV was overgrown and seemed far too old for a mobile home. I knocked on the door, and an eerie silence followed. As I glanced around, the darkness of the woods seemed to encroach on me. There were no lights, and past the RV there was nothing but inky blackness. Suddenly, a noise from inside the RV caught my attention. I waited, expecting the customer to open the door. But then, from my right, a voice startled me. Turning, I saw a man standing at the corner of the RV, grinning as he inquired about his order. I nodded and handed it over, stating the total. He reached for his wallet, pulled out a $5 bill, and flashed another unsettling smile, saying he needed to get the rest of the money. He turned and disappeared around the RV, and I remained where I was. Something about this encounter was deeply unsettling, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. After a minute or so, my unease grew, and I peeked around the corner to see where he'd gone. In the distance, I spotted a figure standing near what appeared to be a shed. They weren't moving. They were just standing there, like a shadow. Panic surged through me, and I whipped my head back around, my ears straining to catch any sounds. That's when I heard the RV's door open. A different man emerged, locking eyes with me. Just as I began to greet him, he abruptly slammed the door shut. Panic gripped me, and my gaze darted back to the shadowy figure by the shed, which was now making its way back toward the RV. In the dim light, I couldn't discern the object in their hands, but it looked like either a long bat or a rifle. Fear flooding my veins, I sprinted back to my car, fumbling to start the engine with trembling hands. I put it in reverse, my heart pounding. The man from the RV appeared around the corner and calmly stood in the darkness as I drove off. I didn't know what had transpired at that eerie location, but I had no desire to find out. I heated straight home and contemplated calling 911 but I couldn't shake the nagging feeling that I didn't actually understand what had taken place. Ultimately, I made the regrettable decision not to involve the police. The events of that night remain an enigmatic and unsettling encounter with no answers to unravel the true nature of the horror I had narrowly escaped. In the year 2016, I found myself in the unfamiliar territory of working the night shift at a budget motel. My friend Michael had helped me land this job, despite its low pay. Desperate for an office job, I endured several days of swift training, both from my boss in the mornings and Michael during the late night shifts. You see, my boss and his wife had embarked on a week-long vacation, leaving me to man the night shift alone. The motel had security cameras monitored on a screen inside the office building, which was surrounded by large glass windows. There was no traditional night window for guests to approach. They had to enter the office directly. My job was straightforward, check in guests and handle paperwork. One particular night, around 1 a.m., a man walked in, asking if there were any available rooms. I glanced at him and, finding nothing suspicious, told him we had rooms available. He requested just one, and I promptly began creating the reservation. However, as I worked, I noticed something strange. The man started swatting at the air and making spitting noises as if he were swarmed by invisible flies. Trying to ignore this bizarre behavior, I continued with the check-in process. Once I handed him his room key, he promptly walked away. 
However, he soon returned, barging into the office with a forceful slam of his hand against the glass door, causing me to jump in surprise. My heart raced as I looked up to see the man, who had previously appeared normal, now displaying erratic behavior. He cracked open the door, thrusting his head inside and began muttering, I can't get into my room. Why won't you let me in? My initial reaction was to be helpful, so I replied, Maybe there's something wrong with your key. Let me give you another one. However, the unease that washed over me was palpable. I could feel that something was terribly wrong about this situation. I handed him a new key, and he returned to his room. My sense of danger only grew stronger. Panicked, I decided to text Michael for help. But, to my dismay, there was no response. With Michael asleep and unresponsive, I found myself alone in a perilous situation. The man descended the stairs once more, and my anxiety peaked. I retreated to the back office, locked the door, and clutched my pocket knife. I had always believed in being prepared, especially when working night shifts. Outside the office, the man began shouting, Hello? Hello? Why won't you let me into my room? Do you not like me? Though I was terrified, I felt compelled to handle the situation on my own. I replied, I'm just on the phone. I'll be right out, hoping to buy some time. I continued to call Michael repeatedly for help, but there was still no response. Summoning my courage, I stepped out of the office. The man was no longer at the door, but had gone into the restroom. I could hear him talking to himself, his voice dripping with anger. He muttered phrases that sent shivers down my spine like, Killer! Killer! My heart pounding, I began escorting him toward his room. With my arms down, I discreetly held my knife, hidden from view. I couldn't shake the feeling that I was in grave danger, and I kept glancing over my shoulder to ensure he didn't make any sudden moves. We reached the staircase, and I led him up to his room. He followed closely behind me. As we approached his room, I signaled for him to stop. I said, This is your room, as I had confirmed by the door number. However, he proceeded to a neighboring room, seemingly unaware of his error. I quickly corrected him, and as he struggled with the door, I realized he was trying to enter someone else's room. Rushing back to the office, I locked the door behind me. The next guest I checked in was a police officer from a nearby town. I confided in the officer about the unsettling encounter, and they offered to keep an eye out. On the following night, the man returned, but this time I had the doors locked. I informed him that we were fully booked. Despite explaining the bizarre events to my boss upon his return from vacation, he didn't take me seriously. I continued to work the night shift at the motel for another year, and many other strange encounters followed. Back in my 20s, I had landed a job as a storage worker in a desolate warehouse situated at the outskirts of town, a location that never failed to strike me as eerie and remote. The place was a running joke among my co-workers and me. We often questioned why the warehouse owners had chosen such an isolated spot. While it was likely due to the inexpensive land and convenient highway access, the emptiness of the surroundings always unnerved me. Every night, I would pull into the vast, empty parking lot, feeling like I was at the edge of nowhere. I typically worked the night shift alongside my colleague, Tyler, who had shown me the ropes. Our job consisted of breaking down and organizing shipments, moving them to their designated spots in the warehouse for storage. After a couple of weeks, the work became routine, and I would often find myself going through the motions in a semi-drowsy state. On some nights, Tyler and I would be the sole workers on the overnight shift. However, on one particular night, it was Tyler's vacation week, and I found myself alone at the warehouse, working the 11 p.m. to 5 a.m. shift. As I arrived at the warehouse, there was an immediate sense that something was amiss. A car was parked in the far corner of the expansive, empty parking lot. Its lights were off, and there was no sign of anyone around. The situation felt suspicious, as the car was on private property, and I decided to take action. I parked near the entrance and called the police, requesting that they investigate the vehicle. 
The presence of the car, far removed from civilization, made me uneasy. The dispatcher assured me that an officer would arrive shortly, and I waited inside the office. The police arrived approximately 20 minutes later, and they reported that the car was unoccupied with no signs of its owner nearby. They speculated that it might be a broken down vehicle and called a tow truck to remove it. With the situation seemingly resolved, I returned to my work. I spent about an hour moving and organizing shipments before I was startled by a loud bang at the front of the building. Alarmed, I headed to the front of the warehouse, turned on the exterior lights, and approached the entrance. To my astonishment, a man stood outside, pounding his fist against the door. His appearance was disheveled, and he appeared utterly exhausted. I hesitated before addressing him through the glass door, asking if he was okay and why he was on the property. The man responded with agitation, demanding to know the whereabouts of his car while repeatedly banging on the door. Despite my attempts to explain that this was private property, he continued shouting and growing increasingly aggressive, insisting that I let him inside. After issuing a threat to call the police, I finally managed to quiet him down. He retreated, giving me one last unsettling look before walking away. Although I felt relief when he left, an unshakable sense of unease lingered. Returning to my work, I couldn't stop thinking about where the man might have been all this time. My mind raced with possibilities, none of which seemed to make sense. I considered that he might have gone to a nearby gas station for assistance, but the distances involved made that unlikely. Furthermore, if he had obtained a ride, he would have returned before his car was towed. The whole situation baffled me. Just a few minutes after I resumed my duties, I heard another loud bang at the front door. This time, I was both frustrated and frightened. As I approached the entrance, my heart pounding, I peered through the glass and found myself facing the same police officers who had been at the warehouse earlier. They explained that they had received a call from the towing company reporting concerning findings on the exterior of the car's trunk. Apparently, something had gone unnoticed during the initial inspection. They questioned me about the events and the man's appearance. The officers left again, and it wasn't until later in the week that they returned with search dogs to come the forest surrounding the warehouse. They reported finding dried blood on the rear bumper, and after obtaining a warrant to search the car's trunk, they discovered even more blood inside. They believed the man might have attempted to bury a body in the nearby forest. Despite their efforts, no significant evidence was recovered, and the mysterious man never returned to claim his car from the towing company. He simply vanished, leaving behind a lingering sense of unease. For the next couple of years, while working alone on night shifts, I couldn't shake the feeling of vulnerability. The thought of that man potentially returning haunted me. Although it seemed unlikely, the fear that he might seek retribution never truly left my mind. I work as a detective, but my cases are far from the thrilling murder mysteries you see on TV. I specialize in private investigations, dealing with matters like infidelity, locating missing pets, and even documenting instances of school bullying. However, there's one bizarre and unsettling case that stands out among the rest, which I'd like to share. Last summer, I received a call from a woman in her 30s. Her striking beauty caught my attention when we met in person to discuss her concerns. She was incredibly talkative, her words flowing ceaselessly, as if her tongue feared the dark. She had grown suspicious of her husband, who had been returning home later and later from work, and she believed he might be having an affair. I took on the case, agreeing to tail her husband after his work hours to gather evidence. As the days unfolded, I discovered that her husband would leave his workplace around 6 p.m. but not return home until after 10 p.m. Something was undoubtedly amiss during those four unaccounted hours, and I was determined to uncover the truth. Following him discreetly, I watched as he drove through the city, gradually making his way to the suburbs. At first, I assumed he was meeting someone in a residential area outside the city, a common tactic to conceal an affair. 
but as he continued past the suburbs and ventured into the countryside, my assumptions crumbled. I found myself in unfamiliar territory, with nothing around but a few scattered houses and abandoned structures. This wasn't what I had expected, and I began to feel increasingly uneasy. Finally, he led me to the last place I could have imagined, an abandoned love hotel. It was an eerie and unexpected destination. I parked my car a safe distance away to avoid arousing suspicion and planned to circle back to covertly monitor his activities. During this time, I conducted a quick online search about the abandoned love hotel. According to the information I found, the hotel had closed down due to poor management and disturbing activities over a decade ago. It had a reputation for catering to various fantasies and unconventional desires. If couples wanted to explore their intimate fantasies in a themed room, this place offered it all. However, its checkered history and closure left me baffled about why he had chosen this location. As night fell, I observed his arrival at the abandoned hotel. He parked his car, and I prepared to discreetly follow his every move. My mind was still trying to fathom the reasoning behind his choice of location. I approached the dilapidated building cautiously, navigating through the debris-littered lobby. It didn't take long to identify the room he had entered, the source of strange murmurs and sounds. With the door left slightly ajar, I took a discreet peek inside. To my shock and disbelief, I witnessed a chilling scene. The husband stood beside a life-sized naked female love doll on a dusty bed. He was speaking to the inanimate figure as though it were a real person. My heart raced as I watched him undress, his actions suggesting something deeply unsettling. I couldn't bear to witness what I feared would happen next. This was a bizarre and disturbing turn of events, and I knew I had to report it to my client. Relaying the shocking discovery to the wife was a difficult and distressing task. Her reaction and feelings upon hearing the truth will forever remain confidential. All I can reveal is that the revelation was deeply upsetting, and it left me with more questions than answers. I have often wondered about the husband's motives and the reasoning behind his unsettling actions. While I will never fully understand his intentions, the image of that abandoned love hotel and the strange encounter within it continues to haunt me. One friend, intrigued by this eerie tale, posed a chilling theory that sent shivers down my spine. Are you sure the husband wasn't being called to the abandoned hotel by the doll? It's a disturbing thought that lingers, adding an eerie layer to an already unsettling story. Back when I was a high school senior, I landed a weekend job at a highway gas station in New Jersey. The bizarre and unsettling stories I encountered during my year there still haunt me. But there's one that I don't often share, as it goes beyond the realm of funny anecdotes and delves into the truly horrifying. In my time at the gas station, I encountered my fair share of quirky customers and even had a few close calls, but those experiences paled in comparison to the night that still chills me to the bone. It was a regular night shift, around 2 in the morning, when an Audi with South Carolina license plates pulled in. A man stepped out, handed me a $20 bill, and asked me to fill up his car while he used the restroom. He promised an additional $20 if I could do it quickly. Eager to earn the tip, I hurried to fill the tank and noticed a middle school-aged girl, asleep in the back seat, bundled up under a blanket. I didn't want to disturb her and risk losing my tip, so I continued pumping gas, keeping a watchful eye on her. However, as I glanced back at her, my heart plummeted. Her once-closed eyes were now wide open, and she was staring directly at me through the window. In a chilling moment, she silently mouthed two haunting words. Help me. A shiver ran down my spine, and I was momentarily paralyzed. Before I could react or respond, the man returned inquiring if everything was all right. Panicking, I concocted a story, telling him that there was an issue with the pump and that I needed to reset it. I apologized for the inconvenience and assured him that I'd have it fixed shortly. I retreated into the gas station, my heart pounding, and promptly hit the silent alarm. Back outside, I resumed filling his tank, all the while pretending everything was normal. 
I had to keep my cool to avoid escalating the situation or endangering the girl further. The man fell for my act, and I managed to complete the task without incident. As he drove away, I made the call to 911, ensuring that the authorities were alerted to the situation. Fortunately, the dispatcher was quick to respond, redirecting a nearby patrol unit toward the man's location. Moments later, the suspect was pulled over in a traffic stop. The police later commended my actions, reassuring me that I had done the right thing. They gathered valuable evidence from the scene, the license plate number, a detailed description of the man and the girl, and his fingerprints on the cash he'd given me. The story had a relatively positive outcome for that particular girl, and the man was apprehended. However, the incident left me with lingering questions and a heavy heart. How many others find themselves in similarly dire situations, unable to silently signal for help? How many end up in trunks instead of the back seat? How many aren't fortunate enough to be rescued? I try not to dwell on these troubling questions, but I feel a responsibility to share my story as a warning. If this narrative reaches enough people, perhaps it can serve as a cautionary tale and prevent others from suffering in silence. Maybe, just maybe, it can spare me countless sleepless nights spent pondering the fate of those who remain unheard and unseen. A few years ago, I was a college student working the graveyard shift at a 24-7 fast food joint. The job wasn't glamorous, and my co-workers were a rather uninspiring bunch. I took on more hours and even got promoted to shift lead. However, what I didn't realize when I accepted that promotion was that I was signing up for full-time work, which meant they could schedule me for any shift they pleased. Sure enough, not even a week in, they assigned me to the dreaded overnight shift. I was on my own, running the show. When it was quiet, I'd stand there twiddling my thumbs, but when things got busy, it was a relentless grind with no respite. One of those dead of night shifts, while I was slouched in the back of the kitchen, sitting atop a stack of cardboard boxes, I was engrossed in my phone, just trying to kill time. The storm outside had the winds howling and the rain lashed at the windows, creating an eerie ambiance. My headset, which was usually silent in the stillness of the early hours, suddenly beeped. It was the notification for a customer in the drive through lane. I hustled to the computer and asked for their order, but received no response. Strange, considering there were no cars in sight, neither in the drive through nor the parking lot. The system rarely malfunctioned like this, and I chalked it up to the inclement weather, thinking a raindrop or a flash of lightning might have triggered the sensor. I loitered by the drive through window for a few minutes but saw no signs of life. I headed back to my cozy box perch. Another 15 minutes or so passed, and again, my headset chimed in. I turned my attention to the cameras and caught a glimpse of a man walking past the drive through lane. He was wrapped in a thick hoodie and wore a face covering. He vanished from the camera's frame, leaving me wondering how he could have arrived there. The restaurant was surrounded by dark nothingness, except for the nearby road. The idea that he'd walked down the side of that road, unseen, unnerved me. With nothing happening on the cameras for several more minutes, I resumed my phone scrolling. Then, the notification from the drive through rang out once more. This time, I saw the man standing in the drive through lane, peering at the camera, just like a specter from a nightmare. Can I help you, sir? I asked through the microphone. He remained silent, gazing unblinkingly at the screen, his hoodie obscuring most of his face. In the dimly lit, rain-soaked night, I was hit by a paralyzing fear, the sort that makes the skin crawl and the blood run cold. His unbroken silence was as unnerving as the shadows that cloaked him. Tentatively, I refused to take his order. He still said nothing, and I hesitated to escalate the situation further by ordering him to leave. Moments passed like hours as we stood in that surreal standoff. Then, abruptly, he began to walk down the drive through lane toward the side of the restaurant where the window was located. Panic surged through me as I rushed over to the window and slammed it shut. With the window sealed, 
I watched the man outside, his mask and hood shrouding his features, but his intent was painfully evident. I wondered if I should demand he leave, but an overpowering dread kept my voice at bay. He pressed against the glass, his hollow eyes fixated on me, and said, Open up. Fear clenched my chest, and I whispered, No. I couldn't bring myself to engage him any further. Despite my refusal, he lingered outside, his eyes never leaving mine. It was a nerve-wracking encounter that left me drenched in cold sweat. After a few moments, he repeated his request, Open up. I trembled and held my ground, refusing to give in to his demand. Then, as abruptly as he had arrived, he turned and walked away, disappearing into the night. As I watched him go, I heard a disconcerting sound, scraping. It was as though an unseen hand was dragging a sharp object along the building's exterior. Eventually, he vanished from my sight, and I turned to the cameras to verify that he was gone. The coast appeared clear, and he didn't return during the rest of my shift. With a sense of relief, I completed my shift, but I couldn't shake the chilling encounter from my mind. I decided to take out the trash and, driven by an eerie compulsion, ventured to the side of the restaurant where the window was located. There I found it, an unsettling, long scratch along the wall as if it had been created by a knife slicing through the darkness. The police were called, but despite my description and the video footage from our low-quality cameras, the man remained elusive, disappearing into the inky night. I may never know what sinister plan he had in mind that night, but the glint of a knife held Reedy in his hand was enough to chill me to the bone. I've since left that job and tried to erase the memory from my mind. But to this day, I can't help but wonder, what would have happened if I had opened that window? No matter where life takes me, the experience lingers as a haunting reminder to trust my instincts and always be on guard during those lonely hours of the night.